Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So this is uh, part two of the lecture for the topic broad. Okay, we have covered up to uh, we have discussed all the clauses. Okay, A, B, C, D, E, and we stop at D. Okay, because um, clause D, if you still remember, right? This is cash all clause. So. Uh, for today, okay, we are going to have a look, uh, discuss some of the cases okay, in which is part of the syllabus. So we have few cases. We don't have many cases actually, but we have some specific cases in which it shows to us application of session 17. So the cases that, that we are going to discuss today, um, first okay, we have the case of Kung Chui Lian and Wong Ta Kong. Okay. Uh, reported in 1983, MLG, and then followed by the case of uh, Mui Plaza and Hong Leong Bang, uh, 1998, and then Ang Yeok and Yim Yu Kyu. So um, you have to be well versed with all the cases because this is part of the syllabus. Okay, uh, okay let's go. Okay, the first case for today Kang Chui Lian and Wong Tak Tong. Okay. Or uh, usually, uh, in order for you to easily remember the case, try to find some uh, uh, keywords. Okay? So for this case, Kung Trillian basically is about biscuit factory. Not so much on that, but that's the, the unique term, I think. Okay, let's have a look at the facts here. Yeah? So this is the summary of the facts. So it is uh, an old case. In 1954, okay, uh, this is a appeal case, right? Respondent and appellant, the two parties here, they entered, okay, they signed or they executed a document which is called Surat Perjanjian. And this is labeled as the first agreement. I mean, here they have um, at least two or three agreements together, more than one agreement. So what happened was that after um, they signed the agreement, so respondent, uh, he went into occupation of the front portion of the land. So it's quite a, a spacious land. So it has front portion, uh, back portion. So respondent occupied the front portion of the land. And he actually erected, he constructed, he built okay, a biscuit factory on the land, okay, front portion of the land. And later, three years later, in 1957, okay, both of them, respondent and a talent, they executed, they signed another agreement. And this is labeled or this is named as second agreement. And the purpose of second agreement is to subdivide the land because um, in the first agreement, it wasn't, um, this subdivision wasn't done. Okay, so uh, after they signed this agreement, the respondent, um, he was given the front portion, okay. I remember he occupied the front portion key to construct the biscuit factory. So after uh, he signed the second agreement, so he was given the front portion. And then um, in the agreement, it was stated that, well, the area was to be sufficient to accommodate the building on it, obviously. And there's a building on it already. Actually, later, it turned out um, um, it's not true. Okay? In fact, it was less than the area already occupied by the biscuit factory. So, it, it was uh, a smaller area. So, it can't really accommodate the whole biscuit factory. So, what happened next? So, later, so many, many years later, actually, okay, in 1973, a respondent, uh, he lodged a caveat okay, against one half share of the land. So, what is a caveat? So uh, you can have the meaning of caveat here. Basically, um, it is an order from a court. So specifically, uh, it is like a case similar to injunction, right? Um, at keeping the disputed party in the status quo. Meaning that here you can do, um, you can proceed with whatever uh, transaction, okay? Or you can't really have another transaction over the land. I mean, it stops there, okay? All right, it put a stop on whatever uh, things going on, right? So he lost a caveat and then he took out a writ against the appellant because why? He wants to ask, I mean, he wants to claim for uh, his portion, okay, his right over the land. Okay, and then um, uh, when the case was heard by High Court here, okay, this is the decision by High Court. Okay, High Court said, well, respondent here was to be the owner of one half of the land. And then the appellant and her five sons own the other half. So that's the um, the, 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 the the court basically decided okay, which portion that the respondent was entitled to. 
but the appellant was not happy with the decision by High Court. So appellant appeal against the High Court decision. That's why we have this case, okay? the appeal case here. And this is the observation by the uh, appeal court, all right? So the court said, well, the second agreement was voidable. Okay, take note of the word voidable at the option of the respondent. So, I mean, the yeah, respondent was the, the one, um, the, the affected party, okay? And had been lawfully repudiated, set aside, basically, okay? And then, what's the finding? The most relevant part to us here, okay, of the observation, respondent, actually, he was induced into signing, he okay, executing the second agreement, uh, because of what? By the misrepresentation regarding the area granted to him. Remember, okay, he thought the area was um, broad enough okay, to cover the biscuit factory, but actually it turned out to be not enough, okay, not sufficient to cover. So the court said specifically okay, which misrepresentation was fraudulent. So you can see actually that's why when we discuss misrep under section 18, we uh, it is actually overlapping with section 17 okay? which was fraudulent within the section 17 a and d so the case is important because why okay? uh, it shows to us application okay, of uh, clause a together with d remember d is the cash out clause all right so this is the reproduction i mean this is the provision okay the one party induce the other to contract on the faith of representations made to him say any one of which is true so the whole contract is considered as having been obtained fraudulently okay this is actually the uh, observation okay we are done with the case of because biscuit factory or the real i mean the the name of the case is Kung Chui Lian. okay the second case for today is Mui Plaza and Hong Leong Bank uh, Berhad, okay. So one of the banks in Malaysia, Hong Leong Bank here, all right. So let's get to know who are the parties involved here. So we have a few defendants, okay. At least two defendants here. So the first defendant uh, was the bank, okay. Obviously, Hong Leong Bank. And who was the second defendant? Second defendant was the executive chairman of the first defendant. So obviously, the first defendant worked for, for the bank, the staff of the bank. But not normal staff here, executive chairman okay what happened second defendant the chairman executive chairman here he represented uh, that's the important part he represented to the plaintiff Mui Plaza, that he would be responsible okay to the plaintiff for any loss and damage suffered by the plaintiff in allowing the bank to remain in occupation of the plaintiff premises so basically if you read the actual report okay, it's quite uh, lengthy this is just the summary so it involves certain tenancy okay, uh, on the part of the um, Mui Plaza. Okay? So Hong Leong Ben said they want to stay uh, on the premises okay, and that's why they come the issue of misrepresentation here. Okay, all right, this, uh, the ch chairman said, okay, I'll be responsible. It's like something that you promise in the future. Okay, I'll be responsible for whatever happened. Okay? And then plaintiff Mui Plaza okay, uh, claimed that it relied on the said representation by allowing the bank to stay on the premises and because of that, he okay, suffered loss of possible bargaining power with prospective tenants because uh, they cannot proceed with other tenants. Okay? They just allow the banks to stay on the premises. So they suffered certain losses, they suffered certain losses here. Okay, so when the case was brought, uh, brought um, up in the court, okay, so this is the relevant part to our topic here. Okay, one of the contention by the plaintiff, okay, plaintiff, Mui Plaza, uh, they claim fraud against the defendant, okay, so under which clauses here, under section 17, specifically C. Remember, C is about promise, okay, all right? So for making a promise without any intention of performing it. So when the executive chairman made the promise, actually he did not have any intention okay, to keep the promise. So the court held that since the plaintiff claims okay, that the representation was false, okay, so he has a cause of action okay, to recover damages for fraudulent misrepresentation and for the thought of deceit. Remember, okay, if we were to refresh with the uh, topic misrepresentation, we discussed about types. Okay, we have three types of misrepresentation. We have wholly innocent, okay, we have negligent, and we have fraudulent. So damages is only allowed for cases involving fraudulent 
misrepresentation. That's why the court said, well, yes, this is a case of fraudulent misrepresentation. So you can actually claim uh, damages. It's either under this uh, law of complaint or you can make it under uh, law of court, okay, under method of deceit, either one, because both are civil in nature, civil action. So we are done with a uh, second case for today. Okay, and uh, the case is important because why it explains to us application of 17 clause C. Okay, the third case for today is Ang Hyok Sang and Yim Yu Kyu. Okay, um, uh, the keyword for this case is about um, ancestral land, okay, or even option agreement. Okay, right, Ang Hyok Sang. Okay, let's get to know what happens. Okay, let's have a look at the summary of the facts here. So we have Mr. Chan, okay. Um, who was Mr. Chan? Mr. Chan was the late husband of the respondent. So again, this is appeal case, okay. Late husband of respondent. And Mr. Chan actually was the registered owner of his family's ancestral land. So he owned the land, okay, meaning that he inherited the land. So during his lifetime, Mr. Chan, he executed, he signed a lease agreement. Okay, we have the term lease, we have the term tenancy. So usually lease is uh, for longer period. Okay, all right. Tenancy is for one, two, three uh, years usually. All right. So lease agreement. So he signed the agreement with the appellant. So we need that here, Mr. Chan is the lessor and the appellant was the lessee. Okay, so to whom uh, Mr. Chan leased the land for? 15 years, right? So that's the duration of the lease. And then the appellant alleged that, okay, uh, later actually they signed another agreement. So appellant alleged that by an option agreement, that's the name of the agreement, option agreement, Mr. Chan had agreed to sell the land to him at the price of 80,000 ringgit Malaysia. And because of that, after Mr. Chan died, so appellant, uh, they try okay, to they ask for specific performance. They want to the the option agreement to be performed, okay, to be uh, to take effect, I say, to be enforced. Okay, right. So, um, but this is the respondent's agreement. Okay, so respondent, remember who's respondent? Okay, respondent is the wife of Mr. Chan. Of course, uh, she was not agreeable. Okay. All right, so this is the, her agreement. I mean, her argument. Sorry, her argument. So, respondent's argument. First, okay, uh, this is the, the one which is relevant for our topic. Okay, the option agreement was brought into existence by fraud. So, in other words, uh, the wife was saying that, well, actually, when you ask my late husband to sign the agreement, uh, you committed fraud on him. Okay, because why? The appellant had, I mean the lessee. Okay, remember Mr. Chan was the lessor? So the lessee had fraudulently induced Mr. Chan to sign the same. I mean to sign the option agreement by falsely representing to him that, well, that's what he said. Okay, the option was merely intended to test the market value of the land and nothing else. But actually when he, Mr. Chan died, actually um, the real, the agreement, the real effect of the agreement is to transfer, I mean, sell and purchase rather than just to test the market value. So there's element of fraud here. Okay, all right. So the court held that after um, going through examining the facts okay, of the case here, yeah? so the court held that this is the observation. Okay, the facts showed that the alleged sale price was way below the market price. So it put a question mark here. Why um, Mr. Chan was selling the uh, if he were to sell okay, the, the, the land here, yeah, ancestral land, why it was below market price, all right? So because of that, okay, in the context of the business arrangement between them, okay, between the last all I say here, as represented by the lease agreement, okay, there can be no doubt, so it's very clear, okay, no doubt that fraud had been established, had been proved by the appellant's act okay, in deceiving and inducing. So, I mean, you committed fraud and then you induce Mr. Chan to sign the option agreement. Okay? So, within the meaning of section 17. So, in this case, the court or even, I mean, the council did not really specify okay, uh, under which specific clause. But, obviously, it is a case of fraud. So, it is a case under section 17, Context Act 1950. So, that's the third case for today. Okay, and then this is what the court said. Okay, very strong um, statement. Okay, a remark by court here. Yeah? 
the court could not see any purpose okay, of the option agreement. This is the finding, okay, other than as a ploy, okay, the whole plan, the whole plot ploy, okay, to deprive the late Mr. Chan of the true market value of the dosun. Because why? The dosun, the orchard here, um, the value is very high. But when you ask him to sign the option agreement, okay, uh, you quoted very low price here. So actually, you want to deceive. I mean, um, the appellant was trying to deceive. Mr. Chan, okay? that's the real purpose of the option agreement, not to test the market value as claim or being alleged by the uh, Alan. Okay, so we only have three cases uh, for the application. You can, I mean, you have more cases in your textbook, but this is the least of the cases that you have to know or must remember. Okay, uh, the more is the better, lah, as usual. All right, so we, we come to the last part of the topic. As usual, okay, we want to know what's the effect uh, whenever a, a contract is vitiated by fraud, what happened to the contract? What's the effect? So remember, it's not void, okay, it's voidable. So it's similar to the uh, earlier topic, the earlier topic, previous topic, misread, okay, fraud, and the influence, all the um, contract, it becomes voidable. So again, uh, we refer, cross refer to section 19, it talk about uh, voidable contract and this is the meaning, lah. okay, all right. And remedies, so we have some um, relevant provisions here. We have section 30, SRA, it talk about a rectification of instrument where fraud is established. So sometimes it's possible to rectify and proceed with the contract. Remember, it's voidable, so it's still possible to proceed with the contract. Uh, another one is section 34, section 1, key clause A, a specific relief act. It provides for recession. Okay, I mean you set aside the contract. Of course, you apply. I mean the party, um, the affected party needs to apply to the court. And other relevant section, as usual, will be okay. You put it together. Okay, sixty-five, sixty-six, and sixty-seven of contracts. It talk about void. Okay, void contract. The effects. Okay, what happened to, um, what happened to the obligation of the parties here? Okay, before we uh, we end our lecture for today, this is the last case, I believe. Uh, Abdul Razak bin Dato Abu Sama and Shah Alam Properties. I remember discussing the case in our early topic, but it's okay. We just refresh. So, uh, let's have a look at the facts here. Um, it involved uh, sale and purchase, okay? All right. Plaintiff was the purchaser. And then, uh, when he brought the case to the court, he claimed, he alleged that he had entered into this uh, sale and purchase agreement okay, with the defendant. So obviously, the defendant was the vendor. In respect pertaining to apartment, okay, apartment building. So based on defendant's fraudulent misrepresentation. So that's the claim. Okay, that's the allegation by the plaintiff, the purchaser. Uh, and then at the high court level, the claim was dismissed. But at, when the case uh, was brought, I mean, appeal to the federal court, okay, um, the plaintiff won the case. So his plaintiff, I mean, the, the appeal was allowed. So the federal court set aside the agreement and ordered the defendant. So this is among the orders okay, in the area to refund the purchase price with interest thereon and to pay damages. Remember, okay, whenever a case involving fraud, okay, fraud and misrepresentation, um, the affected party, I mean the claimant, might, I mean, is entitled to claim for damages, monetary compensation on top of refund. I mean, we restore, I mean, we set, set aside the, the contract and then on top of that, okay, you can also claim for monetary compensation. Okay, let's say you prove the case under wholly innocent. No, you cannot, you cannot prove, uh, I mean, you cannot claim for Damages. Okay, you can only get a refund. I mean, we restore, we rescind the contract and we restore back you to the earlier position, but you cannot ask for damages. But for fraudulent misrepresentation or for fraud here, yeah, you can ask for damages. Okay, and then uh, remember, okay, here actually High Court and then Court of Appeal and Federal Court. So before the Court of Appeal, the relevant issue okay, to us here, all right. Um, there was discussion on what measure of damages was the plaintiff entitled to recover consequent upon obtaining a decree of recession of the agreement. I mean, how to calculate the damages okay, once you rescind the contract here. Okay, and this is basically the, um, the observation by federal court, all right, the decision by federal court here, okay. 
fraudulent misrep. So yes, you can get a recession. Okay, and then all right here, this is the uh, the the rule of assessment pertaining to a uh, law of contract. Remember, okay, all right. So assessment of damages should not be on the basis of breach of contract. Remember, okay, it's not a case of breach, obviously. Okay, all right. So basically, this is on the basis that the contract had been rescinded. We set aside, okay, which would place the plaintiff in the position he would have uh, had not um, had he had not been induced by the fraudulent misrepresentation. So that's the aim of uh, allowing the um, the damages. Okay, it's not based on breach of contract. I mean the the measurement or the the, the consideration will be different, obviously. Okay, all right. So, damages here is limited to, okay, to recover expenditure reasonably incurred in consequence of the fraudulent misrepresentation, whether before or after the recession. So, it's quite limited, okay, in comparison to cases involving breach of contract. Okay, that's all for the topic of fraud. So, basically, we have covered it all. So, um, okay, that's all. So, I'll see you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.